The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Okay, so thank you everybody for making it to a early day, early time slot talk. I, I appreciate that, appreciate your attendance. Um, so I'm actually gonna go ahead and I'm gonna do something as an introduction and then I'll come and do my introduction. So part of our themes here is uh, with this talk is promoting literacy. So we're gonna have our, our reading rainbow moment and I'm gonna read about two pages out of uh, this book called The Superman to get our imagination working, get our mind's eye working to see where we need to go with this. Okay. And I got here at uh, like 1.30 last night from a layover in Detroit, so hopefully I'm, hopefully I'm with it. So just bear with me. For six days, you six, oh wait, I have a slide on this. Let's try again. There we go, that's the visual for the story. Okay, try again. For six days, U-66 poked and prodded the gray water of the Atlantic Ocean, frantically searching for a place to surface, but the ships were always there. At any time of day or night, the planes and ships would close in, and the crew of the U-boat would flee for their lives, hoping to find a safe haven. Now, they were surfacing again, and Captain Lieutenant Gerard Seahawson, the U-boat's commander, would have preferred to come up at another time and another place, but he was running out of options. Here in the mid-Atlantic on the moonlit night of May 5th, 1944, U-boat life was dangerous, but this was incredible. Every place U-66 went, it was hounded. It could barely surface without being stalked. Time was running out. Seahawson's U-boat could go no further without running its power generators which provided electricity and light and needed to rendezvous with a refueling ship. With his U-boat at the water's surface off the Cape Verde Islands, Seahawson quickly sent a message to the radio room. The radio operator typed a message into a machine called Enigma, which scrambled its text. Then he broadcast it to Berlin, typing out Morse code, refueling impossible under constant stalking. Mid-Atlantic worse than the Bay of Biscay. The message included the sublocation, a standard practice for all German U-boat transmissions. Seehausen never worried that the Allied forces would intercept his message and crack the code during his hour at the water's surface. If they found him, as he knew they might, it would be by some means other than cracking the code. Never by cracking the code. No one could crack the German Enigma that quickly. Minutes after U-66 surfaced somewhere near the African coast, a teletype clattered to life in a Washington, D.C. laboratory. The machine rattled away, sending the lab's operators into a frenzy. One grabbed the teletype paper output and frantically keyed in a message into punched paper tape. Another fed tape into a seven-foot-high, 5,000 pound calculating machine. Inside the machine, primitive logic circuits examined U66 message. Outside the labs, code breakers anxiously awaited its response. C. Hawson could never have imagined the scenario taking place halfway around the world. To think that someone was intercepting his message, then sending it across the Atlantic where a 5,000 pound machine was stripping away its encryption codes would have been beyond the bounds of the most dedicated science fiction fans. For that matter, the activity in the Washington DC laboratory was beyond the imaginative scope of almost every US government official. Other than President Roosevelt, few knew of the effort mundanely titled Communications Supplementary Activity Washington. The decryption activity was cloaked by such secrecy that its highest ranking officials required ultra secret clearance, a security level even higher than that of the Manhattan Project. Now, the machines were cracking U66 message, and it was about time. Since early in the war, U66 had done more than its share of damage. American intelligence 
blamed it for sinking the Allen Jackson, a 435-foot oil tanker owned by Standard Oil of New Jersey. They also blamed it for sinking the Lady Hawkins, an ocean liner with 212 passengers on board, mostly civilians, including women and children. Many sinkings were ugly. Victims swam through thick black smoke and layers of floating fuel, often burning to death after the fuel was ignited by signal flares. But the tables were turning. The cryptologist at the Nebraska Avenue lab cracked the code of the U-66 message, refueling impossible under constant stalking, mid-Atlantic worse than the Bay of Biscay. Then came the most important information, 17 degrees, 17 minutes north, 32 degrees, 29 minutes west. And through a series of channels, the cryptologist relayed their information to the destroyer USS Buckley, which steamed through the mid-Atlantic towards Seahawson's U-boat. Seahawson suspected that it was only a matter of time before the Allied carriers' destroyers found him. They had been hounding him since April 29th, and it was nearly midnight of May 5th. Now he could see the USS Buckley about 2,500 yards away. It was far too late to dive. An emergency dive would take as long as 20 minutes. He would have to face the Buckley, and he knew he had no chance of surviving. Seahawson would never know the truth about his sub-sinking. He would never hear about the red brick building clacking, cracking the Enigma code. He would never suspect that his sub's real nemesis was an ancestor of a machine that would one day be called the digital computer. So we'll come back to that story. These pictures here, so the, um, the one on the, the, the destroyer, that's the USS Buckley. That was the, the one that we read about. And then on the bottom picture, uh, one of those two subs uh, actually is the U U66. And then the other picture, that is not a replica. That is an actual piece of, of the machine that was used in the story. Uh, they called them, their code name on both sides of the Atlantic for the, the encryption breaking machines was bombs. And they spelled it differently. But, but one of the reasons why they picked that name is because if you actually read some papers or overheard someone talking about the bombs, you would probably think something else. So we'll, we'll come back to the story. So who am I? My name is Thomas Stover, and I am a, a senior software engineer. So that's my day job is, is in development. But I am a huge fan of history of all kinds. And then out of that, you have the niche of computer history, which is fascinating. And then out of that, there's a further, you know, uh, narrow that down more to even the security-related context of computer history. So um, that's why that's why I'm here today, try something a little bit different. So normally I do technical talks. In fact, on Sunday I'm giving a talk on Erlang, and if you're interested, please come and check that out. Um, so when we say computer security when we, in this context, um, I'm going to narrow that down a little bit and help give some, some scope of what it is we're, we're trying to accomplish here with our narrative. Um, the, the first area I've got is, is the concept of security of, of protection from each other. You can say criminal behavior. So if someone steals your credit card, spies on you, whatever, th these, are, these are essentially criminal uh, actions that you're trying to protect you from. Uh, the other area is when we, you know, protection from our leaders, the way we think of, probably gets the most attention current events wise lately, other than that, is, is, is the civil li liberties notions, the idea of what degree of uh, freedom should we have to be able to um, control systems ourselves. And then, uh, we also have the concept of protection of our civilization, military science, as in the story we just read. Now, what I would like to get everyone to contemplate is the idea that, that these are very interrelated concepts. And once you start trying to analyze one or the other, they, they, they intertwine and they interdepend on each other. And they're, you, they're very hard to separate these out from both the technical perspective uh, and from political and, and historical perspectives. Um, so, um, okay, so what do we mean by security? You know, in this context, we'll, we'll use nature's definition, which means the capacity for violence to defend against violence. You know, whether that means, you know, okay, the police are gonna get you if you steal my credit card to, you know, we, we have the potential to conduct a, a war against you. Um, so the espionage and sabotage are, are some areas we mentioned back in our story. The other ones that, 
that are also related that, I, again, we're trying to get, hopefully, to think about things in a new perspective, to gain some, some different way of looking at things, is that there's a whole category of, of weapons that you can make when you, with one of the components, is a computer. Um, excuse me, like a, a guided missile, drone, things like this. Um, and then the other area we'll talk about is once you have computers, there's other things that you can make that don't, they're not comprised of computers, but you have to have a computer to be able to do them in the first place. And that gives some fascinating things. So, um, okay, we'll continue our crypto analysis theme that we started with. So in the story, which uh, we were reading, these are, the Germans had the, the famous Enigma machine. These, this is a, some actual recovered ones. Uh, they were all over the place throughout the war. They had um, many different generations of the technology. We're not going to exhaustively talk about this because this is a pretty popular story. But if you've never read about the Enigma, please do. It's a fascinating story. Um, and then the other one that, um, so I gave this talk actually um, last week in Austin at Texas Linux Fest. And I got some very good questions and feedback. So I'm going to try to incorporate um, some more of that as we go forward because uh, we actually have plenty of time with this. It was, I, I, underrated the amount of material we had. So what I wanted to mention uh, with this is that you know the, the Americans actually did have an unbreakable code system. Uh, unbreakable as in it wasn't broken during the duration of the war. And that in the Pacific Theater where they used a system of coded messages, they came up with code words, but then they said those code words in the Navajo Indian language. And the, the difference between the Navajo Indian language and Japanese was sufficiently different to where they weren't able to break that in the time frame. And so one of the things that's, that's fascinating to me about is, is again, you have this, that's another theme in the, in the larger narrative of the human mind versus the computer, of the man versus the mechanical, and what is superior. And so something that is seemingly as inefficient as, or seemingly as primitive as a human language was actually more effective than all this stuff. So the other, other um, thing I'll, I'll point out there is that, uh, we'll, come, we'll come back to that. This is a, a replica that was, that was rebuilt by hobbyists of what gets more attention, the, some of the more famous um, machines that they had on, in England. This was at Bletchley Park. We, there are probably more books, there's probably more movies and stories about the, the effort over there that was used to, not just as a precursor to uh, automated crypto analysis, but also of the significance of using computers in a war effort. And this is where a lot of this comes from. Now, one of the reasons when people say, well, why, you know, th this was, this stuff is almost 70 years ago. What do we, be, does this still matter? And of course it matters. I, I, I had the, some of the, the younger people in the audience, I came up and talked to them later, and, and I think that that was hard to impress upon them, the concept that this stuff is still happening constantly. It's just that they're not going to tell you about it, right? So this, because of the, the age of this stuff, besides the fact that it's interesting is it, the dawn of the creation of these things, it's also interesting that we actually, most of the story is most, or we'll never know the full story, is, is in the public eye. We, we, can, we know what happened. Whereas the things that happen now, you know, you'll have to see 100 years from now before they tell you exactly everything that's been happening. Um, so the, the principal figure in the Bletchley Park side of the story um, is this man, Alan Turing, who is famous for many reasons. Uh, when I was finding these pictures on Wikipedia, I noticed that they're actually making another Alan Turing movie to, in uh, Britain that should come out this year. Um, that's his, that's a, one of the statues of him, and he has an apple in his hand. Uh, a lot of people uh, don't know that he was fascinated, or really obsessed, with uh, Snow White and the story of the poisoned apple. And when he was when he was found dead, he there was an apple with a bite out of it, and he did die of cyanide poisoning, but more specifically, it was cyanide gas poisoning. So the apple itself was not a cyanide delivery mechanism. But we do not know if he was killed, or if he committed suicide, or if it was an accident. Those are all considered equal possibilities. So we famously get the term the Turing machine uh, from his name. And where that came from is early on in his career, uh, after early in, in his uh, academic career, he published a paper 
And what he was trying to accomplish is he was trying to explore some new ideas, some new techniques for uh, his, his theories in cryptoanalysis. And as part of explaining that, over to the side, he came up with a hypothetical machine that you could, use, that you, you could understand how you would go about solving these problems in that machine. He never referred to it as a Turing machine. That was a term that, we, that uh, his peers used later on, and we still have that today. Uh, he, he was, it was a person. The idea was that you could take a person, you could set them down, and you could have sheets of paper, and you could have unlimited sheets of paper, and you could have a system for instructions of what, to, what procedures to work out on the paper, and you could go to other pieces of paper, you could reference them, and you could modify the instructions that were on the paper. And so by using this system, there was all sorts of things that you could, he was to say, oh, okay, imagine if we obviously automated this somehow, but in his model it was just a person. So that's where we get the phrase Turing computer, and, and that's on Turing, so we can, we can come back and talk more about that if we want to. Uh, so the book that I was reading from earlier uh, is called The Superman, and this one is, although it does talk a little bit about the, um, the English side, uh, this is mostly about the, the Cold War era um, crypto analysis technology with Seymour Cray. And so Seymour Cray, um, was a, was a brilliant person on par with Turing. He invented a number of things, one of which was the idea of being a, some of the very first computers that used transistors, but he was able to take the, the quality for the transistors at the time was so poor that you really couldn't build a computer with them yet. And he was able to come up with designs to where you could put them in parallel and make networks of transistors to make quality enough systems to where you could actually deliver things, and he by hand created these things. So the other idea here is that at the same time period, you had uh, multiple parallel efforts to develop computers. And in some cases, they knew or were aware of each other, and in some cases, by design, there was some separation. This sort of branch of this is, comes from the, um, uh, the naval intelligence side of the, uh, the story and is the origins of the NSA that we think of today. It comes from this book. So this is a great one. Um, and it, it talks about, or as on the, on the English side of the, of the story, the, the thought process was more to we need to keep a lid on this, keep things more secret, to have more uh, security through keeping it an unknown. Whereas on the American side, there was a theme of, well, number one, we are, we are trying to roll back our military spending. We have to find some way to continue this and to continue this sustainably. We're going to, so we're to an effort to sort of bring this private sector wise, also to leverage the industrial power that you could be gained by using computer technology uh, in the West. So that was that narrative. This is a picture of him, Seymour Cray, and the Cray One Computer and Museum. Now, again, this was all wired by hand, uh, which is fascinating. And he, he would do it. He was get to the soldering iron and, and go right to it. These particular computers are what we would now today call vector processors or um, uh, single instruction multiple data style computers, or, um, so very similar to what you'd use in a, a graphics card, a GPU processor. The way they actually worked is you would actually have to have a completely separate computer that would stand by next to it that would do the I.O. and load the program and do control and stuff like that. So this was, if you wanted to see, you know, the state of the art for you know, state-sponsored crypto analysis efforts in, say, throughout the 60s, 70s, and then further, this was this. This lineage of technology and ideas still continues with us today. So some of the largest farms that we have of servers uh, is, is actually this, this kind of thing, we, they, their architecture continued. At least the idea is that now we use regular commodity hardware, but some of the principles and designs are the same. Um, a lot of times when you see these stories of such and such nation has the world's largest supercomputer, and you think, you know, okay, well, besides the fact of a prestige standpoint, you know, what is the practical value, and, and the, or why is, why is this at least getting state-sponsored money? And the publicly stated reason is we were doing simulations of nuclear weapons, which is no doubt true, but I think 
we can all use our imagination and probably conceive that with the flip of a switch, right, you can take this farm and, and, and use it to brute force use decry de decryption. Uh, that would be a much more practical value that they would pay us for. So you've got to remember, you know, a, lot of our, a lot of our algorithms that we, that we have, they say, you know, it's not that they're unbreakable, it's just that it would say take, you know, 100 years or 200 years with a, with a PC to, to crack it. But let's say you had 100,000 computers. Who has that? Okay. Uh, so yeah, clearing that narrative. So if you've never heard of this story, uh, this is another good one to go research and look at. There is this, um, you know, now the whole idea of like export restrictions on cryptographic technologies, I mean, that's a mute point. We never even talk about it anymore. But if you go back a little bit further, you know, before we, we had things like RSA and this kind of stuff, the big one that people wanted was there was this concept that you needed a, um, a, a hardware accelerated uh, cryptographic routine chip. They called this the Clipper chip. And the reason why this was got so much attention, so much press, is it came from the factory with a back door put in there by the NSA. And so early 90s, there was, that was the big debate about this is going to be the future of, of encryption in, in computers all around the world, was we'll have this, but there's by design, and knowingly, consciously, there will always be this back door. And you know, it didn't obviously work out. But it's fascinating to think about. And one reason why it's fascinating to think that the, uh, the, the doors were left open, so to speak, is we think, well, yes, well, we were able to open source it. We're trying to find ways around it. But the other reason is probably, or it could just as easily be that there are ways of defeating RSA and stuff that we just don't know. I mean, they're not going to tell you about it, right? Okay, so um, kind of moving forward. So our, the next concept is, like I said, arms that you can make with a component of the weapon itself as a computer. So current events-wise, we get a lot of talk about uh, drone this, drone that. You know, is this acceptable in a um, uh, law enforcement capacity? To what extent should this be used in the battlefield, so on and so forth? And we think of these things uh, not really is, is computer security issues, but I think that we should. There's, not, there's obviously more to the story, but there's some overlap there. Um, and you obviously would not be able to do these things without the, without the computer, so you should uh, consider that a component of it. And so what I mean by that is if you s look at the way we're looking at our timelines here, we try to think, what would be the, the earliest example that we can think of of an automated weapon system of some kind? So. Skipping further back, before computers, this man, Nikolai Tesla, who is, uh, the book I had where this one in, I, I need to find which one I read, put that up here. Uh, but he is a, there's a whole subculture about him. If you've never read much about him, he's a fascinating figure to, he's the one we have responsible for, the reason why we have lights in this building that work the way they do. And one of the things he, he actually had examples of was remote controlled robots, and he made a proposal to the Navy uh, this is early 1900s, uh, where you could actually have warships remotely controlled to off the coast. And um, of course, the missing magic in that scheme is the computer itself. So you go a little bit forward and you say, okay, all right, well, what, would, what is probably the, or at least the accepted answer for what is the first computerized weapon system of some kind? And the, what you get is this uh, project called SAGE. And so this is, <coughs> pre-internet, pre-ARPANET, but this is a network computerized uh, missile and air defense system that was fully operational in the mid-1950s. And uh, what you had is a, there were over 200 installations of automated radar facilities with uh, a network of operator facilities, and in some cases you actually had interfaces directly to weapons assets. So it's not quite as war games as you think, because when you look at the details of what they meant by interfacing with the weapon systems, it would literally it would just print out something on a teletype, and then a person would take it and then go over and you know, launch or whatever. So it's not quite full blown Skynet yet, but that's where we get the um, the first of that. And the actual network behind this that's another uh, theme is if you have these continued parallel networks uh, was in use at least up until the mid 1980s they probably I mean obviously they still have their own separate network of some kind but the actual underlying components of it 
Uh, and a trivia question that you get from this is this is actually credited as being the biggest computer ever built, biggest in terms of physical size, because it actually took hundreds of buildings all over the place. Um, so the other thing that you have there that intersects with this is the, the network. And so we, we like to think of a uh, communication network as being a gift of the computer. Or, and um, that is true in the sense that it makes it more accessible and, and can grow more. But it's not true in the sense that that was the, the origin. So another book I'd like to recommend that is not necessarily security related, although it does, uh, we do see a, the initial uh, discussion and renaissance of encryption for communication in the early days of the telegraph network. But uh, it's, um, it's worth considering that you know, well over 100 years ago, you had true global real-time communication. Now, this was in the hands of the powerful. And we, so the idea of this disseminating into more and more people is just a continued theme that dates back this early. So you know, we still have, what, 2 billion people on Earth that don't have internet access? So it's not, this narrative still continues. And yes, we can do things that we couldn't do before because of computers, and you can make them cheaper and faster and better, but the concept of the network itself predates that. Um, if you're interested in the early network or early internet era, a couple more books that are not exclusively about it, but they touch on it that I've read. Uh, one of them is a fascinating one in general about the Xerox Park story, but they, in the early parts, they kind of explain where some of the money and where some of the uh, characters originated from in that story. And then the other one is this book uh, by Servio Ornstein is kind of just his tale of being a you know, hacker in the trenches from this time period. And he gives some information I'd never heard before about uh, uh, University of Hawaii, some of their network models and stuff that were created. So these are, these are both great books. So OK, moving on a little bit more. So then we have, um, you know, OK, now that you have computers, what are some things that you can make that you um, otherwise wouldn't be able to. So the big one that gets the most attention is the hydrogen bomb. So um, it is conceivable that this could be done without the age of computers, but certainly not on the time frame that we had. And it probably, or you could make a case that we would have never been able to create a hydrogen bomb without uh, uh, computer-assisted computational processing. So the computers that they had there, um, this is in Los Alamos. This is, of course, this is after you know, the atomic bomb. This is later on. This is another generation forward. These were still not fully complete Turing machines yet, but they, you could pro reprogram them. The cables that you see on the wall there, that's actually how you would reprogram. You have to physically rearrange patch panels. Um, but you could, you could do things much more faster than you otherwise would go. So the principal figure behind uh, being able to make the, the first fully electronic Turing complete machine is this man, uh, von Neumann, Johnny von Neumann. And he was also, had it not been for him, not only would you not have that, but you would not have had the hydrogen bomb, uh, even though we think of that as just a narrative with Oppenheimer and the, those people. It, uh, I'm excuse me, Tell, William Tell. Uh, the, um, you wouldn't have had the computer without him. And so if you get anything from this talk, it's please go read this book. I was at uh, Northwest Linux Fest a couple years ago, and uh, George Dyson, who wrote this book, lived in Bellingham, Washington. And he was on the last leg of his book tour. And uh, he had spent 10 years of his life making this book. And he goes deep and does goes into the basements of places and finds uh, records that, that have been lost and been forgotten. And he contests a lot of uh, accepted narratives of, of where some of these things came from. But the story that he puts together is, is fascinating with a lot of different characters, a lot of different reasons. But he also attributes, he really tells a story of, of who von Neumann was and what we had to thank him for. And his, his model is you have the, the Old Testament of computing, uh, the, the prophet being this uh, man named Leibniz, who's a contemporary of Sir Isaac Newton who we credit today with things like the, uh, the way an arithmetic logic unit works. Um, he rediscovered binary arithmetic. He's a fascinating person. He, uh, as a philosopher, he had the, um, he's credited with the <coughs> amazing notion that 
God created the best possible universe, which uh, by definition, if he's God, he would have created the best possible, which is a fascinating concept. Uh, and then the New Testament prophet is, is uh, Alan Turing. And the figure in, in the middle is von Neumann. So the book is really about von Neumann. And it uh, explains uh, that he was the right person at the right time with the right connections to make this happen. And had the war not been going on, uh, this probably would not have happened. And um, another interesting thing about him is that where in the institute that was that was paying where he worked mostly, you know, he, he had a lot of Einstein worked there, for example. But these people, a lot of them were pacifists, and in this, which is fine. But he was quite adamant that he was specifically trying to kill Nazis. He was an immigrant. He escaped from uh, Hungary, and you know, he was. He said, "Look, these they've killed my whole family." He tried to join the army when he got here. Uh, they told him he was too old. And uh, Fascinating. So, oh yes. So the other thing about him is that uh, in his model, it wasn't, you know, the weapon. Right? Was was not the hydrogen bomb. The weapon was the computer. So if you think about, you know, what is the most amazing or significant or dangerous thing that you can build once you have a computer? More computers. And that was large. A lot of his ideas and his teachings and ideas was that you can have successive generations of computers. And they were already at the point where they were doing that. They were using primitive computers to simulate, model, and design newer computers. OK. So uh, moving to our um, civil liberties concept, um, there, there's a question, you know, all right, all right so this, we think of all these horrible things that can happen when you have this power, right? So you know, what, what happens when? Evil people have these things, right? And the question that comes up in a kind of a debate class style is, uh, is just precisely that. And someone asked William Buckley one time, they said, you know, what would happen? Can you imagine if the Nazis had had the computer first, or if they had had the computer at all? You know, how much more efficient would they be in their aims? What would it think of the horrors that they could have accomplished? And he said, well, you know, that's not an argument against technology, that's an argument against Nazis which is simple, but it's interesting to contemplate. But what a lot of people don't realize is that the Nazis actually did have the very first Turing complete computer. Uh, this man, if I'm, I'm told the way you pronounce his name is Zeus. It's, pronounced, it's written like Zeus. But uh, Conrad Zeus uh, is actually credited with the first fully complete Turing machine. This is a replica of it in Germany. And that's a picture of his statue. Um, now, the, the difference here is that this is made out of relays. So you're talking about an electromechanical system. So you're still talking about one, two, or three orders of magnitude slower than the fully electronic systems, which are made with vacuum tubes. So what happened to this? Where did, where did this go? Well, uh, Hitler actually directed that the more of the money go to the V2 projects. And um, for a while there, this was kind of lost. So. It's easy to just kind of imagine, though, in an alternative timeline, you know, when you have things like this, there was the rocket, there was Heisenberg, who almost had the bomb first. Um, things could have been quite different. Um, so then I'll take to the last slide, then I have some other comments, is that, relating it back to this conference, is that it is very important to maintain control of your devices, or at least the ability to do so. Uh, we, we take so many things for granted as far as firmware or what may or may not be written in microcode. Uh, and it's very hard to say to what degree of control we actually do have of, the, of our computers that we use. And I think that um, one, of the thing, one of the perspectives I'd like to present to you is the notion that you should, we should treat computers with the same kind of res attitude of respect that we treat firearms and that we also treat larger weapon systems, that they are potentially that deadly, but they're also critical for the balance of power. And especially in the context of well, Western or American ideas about that, that's something that we all have, and that's something that we should maintain. And so if you look at, say, von Neumann's model of you know, what, what was more powerful, what was more dangerous? Was it the hydrogen bomb or the computer? And, you know, the computer, we, we're not allowed to have hydrogen bombs. We can all have computers. But who really controls these things? 
who is it that's, you know, do you have the ability to do what it is you want? Do you trust it? And um, ultimately, no, but you can get closer in that direction with free software. It, it is a, it's a very big deal. Um, so this is the last of the slides I had, so now I'm gonna try to touch, recap some things that came up and questions and comments that we had. So one, that I, after I haven't got a chance to update these slides this week yet, I will before I turn them in, so you can have the reading list. Uh, uh, we had someone from the audience last time, they recommended a, a great book uh, called IBM and the Holocaust, which I can't say anything about, but uh, evidently this was about some of the uh, census machines that were made, and it sounds as bad as it, uh, as the title gives it, so we, that's another one to check out. The other one, the other discussion that came up uh, about this was um, the notion of um, you had these people, especially like we talked about Heisenberg and some others, who um, we recognize in Zeus, Zeus, we recognize them uh, for their their fame for what it is they did. But we look at you know who they were, and, and we don't we somehow kind of skip the judgment of their character, and um, so just. And that applies on this is just remember that the, the seduction of technology and seduction of power, it's easy to get sucked in and to think. And so just be, have a conscience, have, have, um, have a frame of right and wrong. So what it is you're working for and what it is that you are trying to do with it. Uh, and then the other theme I'd like to, to point out, I came up with um, my son who's third grade and we're learning uh, you know, math homework, right? And you know, like everyone, you know, why do I have to do this? Why can't we learn to check with the calculator? And it, it regained the, the, the narrative of um, who's in charge? Who is the master of who? You know, to what degree of trust do you have in that calculator? And again, you know, we are so, I would say that in a way, uh, while we, so like if you look at, if you looked at some of these systems and you looked at, you watch Twilight Zone, you watch the way that people used to view things, the, it was not about the people behind them. The fear was the actual technology itself. And so we have a, come a, a ways in our understanding and our perception of these things to where we still view computers and technology as inanimate objects. And we at least have enough uh, maturity with it to, to look at, well, it's, it's the person behind these things. But we are still sort of conditioned to feel that these things are non-biased. And that's, that's where I'm getting at. These, not necessarily so. We may be an inanimate object and maybe a person behind it, but you need to still question that. Don't still don't necessarily trust the Wizard of Oz at, uh, at face value. And um, so, with that, I will I will take if anybody's got any questions, or I can continue to, to ramble. So, um, well, okay. Well, I appreciate your time and your attention. I will put these uh, I will put these slides up on the website and you can get the links for the books and I will be around for uh, till Sunday so if anybody would like to uh, talk about this. Thank you very much. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process.
the agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.